Our hymn is number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness, the first and second verses, number 140. Please remain standing for the gospel lesson from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, can be found on, your, on page 60 in your New Testament in your pew Bible. Now hear the word of the Lord. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. You may be seated. Will you pray with me as we begin this morning? God, I pray that in these moments today, that you help to open our ears so that we might hear open our eyes to see, and God, we pray that you open our hearts so that we might receive your love that is offered to us today. Amen. 
I've confessed before that I am a list maker. I like to write things down and physically be able to put a check mark next to the things that I've accomplished. I like to be able to, at a glance, to get a sketch of what my day or week might look like given my responsibilities and tasks that I have before me. You'll see in the bulletin that there is an insert. Have you found it yet? This might seem like a peculiar type of insert. It's just a blank sheet of school paper. Now, whether you actually write down your thoughts or things that you must do on a sheet of paper for your week, today this sheet of paper is symbolically representing for us things that consume our attention. The lines are symbolically representing the limited amount of time in a day. And if you're anything like me, all the margins represent everything else I try to squeeze in, leaving almost no room for surprises or unscheduled events. We're already beginning to approach what I think has become some of the busiest and most consumed time in most of our lives, Christmas. There are so many expectations of baking cookies, singing carols, wrapping presents, hosting Christmas parties, planning with our families, that those expectations easily capture our attention more than the expecting Mary or making preparations for the greatest gift of the season. Today, I'm going to invite you to hold this sheet of paper as we talk. I invite you to think about and consider what consumes you and what's on your list of to-dos. Although I actually hesitate to do that because I'm afraid that you'll actually stop listening to me or get distracted or maybe even use this sheet of paper as a sketch pad for, to write down your list of to-dos that you now are thinking about because you have to get some stuff done this week. I also recognize that we aren't all in the exact same space and stage of life. Some of us have kids, some of us don't. Some of us have kids that are young and others have grown children. Some of us have full-time careers and jobs, be it in the business world or in the home raising a family. Some of you are retired and others are just getting careers started. Regardless of your status and stage in life, I imagine that we can all identify with being consumed at times. Because we can get consumed with any number of things, with accomplishing, proving, providing. We can get consumed by worry, or grief, or guilt, or difficult situations. We get consumed with expectations. We get consumed with feeling like we have to fix things or make everyone else around us happy. Can you think of something that might consume you at times? You know, one of the most beautiful things about our humanity to me is our capacity. We have a great capacity. God created such a wonderful diversity within each of us that we really do have the capacity to do so much. We can look back in history and see this over and over again. We have grown and evolved to think bigger and do more. We can look at in inventions and accomplishments of those who have gone before us and realize that their capacities have enabled our own capacity for further growth and development. One of the realities about our capacity, however, is that it's not always historically or still even today been used for the betterment of others and the world around us. Just as recently as Friday in Paris, we are reminded of the capacity of evil acts and hatred. But we also have a great capacity 
of love and forgiveness. We have the capacity to explore and imagine. We have the capacity to be creative and connect in amazing ways. Just think of the internet. The, the creation of the internet has extended our capacity to function as a global community in an entirely new way. We have the capacity to have kids who have four different activities they're involved in, manage careers, volunteer in our community, serve on a committee here at the church, coach soccer, cook supper, visit and care for our parents. I could go on and on. Our capacity as humanity is truly incredible. But, did you sense that there was a but coming? But... There is a big difference between us determining our capacities, what our capacities are, what our skills and gifts and talents and desires are, and using them to better express and enjoy life and connect with others than these capacities beginning to decapacitate us. Now, I know that that is not a real phrase, but... Our capacities certainly have the ability to disconnect and to remove us from the joy of our capacity. This happens when we become so focused on accomplishing the goal. When we begin to believe that success really is measured by the amount of check marks next to all of our tasks. We easily and often judge ourselves and others based on our busyness and productivity so that in the midst of God creating us with this great capacity, we begin to feel like that we have failed if we can't get that promotion or make the soccer team or cheerleading squad or we see that our kids are struggling. The danger is that when we begin to connect with tasks and things and accomplishments rather than connecting with one another and with God. And as we do this, it becomes more difficult for us to listen or for God to be able to move and act because we have already filled the lines on the page with our own stuff. We've used every unmarked space and fill even the tiniest places in our life, squeezing in more and more. The gospel story in Mark today is a bit odd. The lectionary reading stopped at verse 8, which is less than a quarter of what is actually the longest Jesus narrative in the book of Mark. Verses 9 through 35 continue to be Jesus' voice about how the world is going to experience things before Jesus returns again. But we only have those first eight verses today. I almost laugh thinking about Jesus and his disciples walking out of the temple. One of his own disciples commenting on how large and wonderful the building is. And Jesus is like, you see this large building? None of it will be left standing. It's all going to fall. You see, this is Jesus' last time leaving the temple before his own journey to the cross. This is an apocalyptic text in which Jesus is talking about end times and a second coming. They have left the temple and then he finds himself with four of his beloved disciples sitting on the hillside on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew feeling like they have Jesus in private, like the, they're behind closed doors, that they have him all to themselves. They ask Jesus if he would at least tell them what the signs will be that all these things are going to be accomplished. Jesus, won't you at least tell us what we can do, what we need to be prepared for? This sounds pretty strategic of the disciples, although I'm not actually sure that they were prepared to hear 
all that he would say next because he does begin to share with them all the different things that they will hear about and experience for themselves. And as we heard the words read today, the signs are not warm and fuzzy, but they are profound and have roots in difficulty and discord. And at the same time, I can imagine Jesus also being with his disciples and thinking, come on, guys, I've already told you before what is the most important thing anyway. Literally, in the chapter right before this, in chapter 12 in Mark, Jesus, in the midst of a dispute between some scribes, tells them to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and to love your neighbors as yourself. This is the new commandment, and this is the most important thing, he tells them. You see, Jesus in these moments is acknowledging with the disciples that not only the world of their day, but of what we continue to know and experience today. There are things that happen in our lives that are very difficult and sad. There is destruction. There are broken relationships. Disasters happen. But Jesus does not tell them these things and then leave them empty and in despair. He has already first told them and reminded them to focus on their capacity to be loving and caring for one another. And to be focused on God as he's already shown them. Because if you do this, not only will your capacity to love increase, but others will see it. And through it, they will too see God. I often say that I am so thankful for the witness of the disciples. Because they remind me that God can use mess-ups and misfits to do the work of the kingdom. Because I hear myself in the disciples. I want to know how to be best ready, what needs to be on my list, how I can be best prepared for all the events that I might encounter in life. But if we let this be our focus, we often end up living like the end is happening, don't we? Like if we don't do enough or accomplish enough, then we have failed. Failed ourselves, failed others, even failed God. We can feel like it's the end of the world if we mess up or don't have everything together and we don't check off all the things on our lists. We are a world that is looking for signs. We constantly are looking for signs. Signs that we're succeeding Signs of affirmation of a job well done. Signs of confirmation that we're doing the right thing. The pressure that we put on ourselves and on others around us can be life-sucking and exhausting. The Old Testament lesson, the story of Hannah today, certainly captures one who is lost and seeking guidance. Hannah is hurting over not being able to conceive a child. She is frustrated with her husband, and she's mad at the priest. But she continues to connect with God. The story of Hannah shows that she is vulnerable with God, that she cries out to God, sharing her, the deepest concerns of her heart. She doesn't stop seeking God, even when we probably wouldn't blame her for being mad and turning away. Instead, with Hannah, we can see signs. Signs of, in the midst of there being pain, there's the presence of prayer. She reminds us that in the midst of despair, there are signs of hope. In the midst of brokenness, There are signs of the possibility of healing. Diana Butler Bass spoke at Decatur First Baptist 
on Thursday night. She's a professional theologian with a PhD in religion, and while her study is of religion and the church, she most often is seated where you are in the congregation as a layperson. She was in town discussing her latest book called Grounded. In it, she tells the story of how she arrived at this title of Grounded. She talks about the busyness of her life. She describes hopping on one plane to to give a lecture or a seminar and then hopping on another plane to do it all over again. She describes nights spent in hotel rooms, only talking with her family on the phone for brief moments. She talks about meals out of a bag or a box, rarely being able to sit down with the people that she loves. One day after arriving back home at her and at her home in Alexandria, Virginia, after a whirlwind tour of events, she walks into her yard and she looks at her husband in exhaustion. And she says, I wish that someone or something would ground me. I just want to be grounded. The book becomes her exploration of becoming grounded being grounded in God and be grounded by God. There are signs of busy all around us. There are the signs of destruction. There are signs of hurt and pain. There are signs of war, internationally, domestically, and wars that rage inside our own bodies and hearts. And it is so tempting for us to ask God to show us the signs of how we can best be prepared. But often, instead of looking for signs of God moving in and through us and others, we get uncomfortable and anxious and we fill the space on our own accord. So not only is there not space for God on the lines of our papers, but we leave little room in the margins either. There's not room left for God or to see God. We have scheduled every moment. And even in our unscheduled moments, we don't take the time to look for God. Those things that consume us, that we fill on our sheets of paper, also consume the possibility of us experiencing and knowing God. Friends, you have a great capacity. Today, my prayer is that we might all be reminded not just to fill time and space based on what we think the world expects of us, but to be grounded to be rooted in God's capacity. For God's capacity is full of love. God's capacity is full of grace and forgiveness. Be less about the margins and more about filling the lines with meaningful time, filling the pages of your life with connection. Connection with God and connection with those around you. May it be so. Amen. This morning, our closing hymn is a hymn of invitation. It's number 419, I am thine, O Lord. I'll invite you to stand as you're able and let us sing together verses 1 and 4 of 419, I am thine, O Lord.